The Children of Williston Lane, a true story of hope and survival during World War II, Young Readers Edition. Vienna, 1938. Chapter 1. As she had done every Sunday since her 10th birthday, 14-year-old Lisa Jura boarded the lumbering streetcar in the heart of the Jewish section of Vienna and crossed the city heading for Professor Eisel's studio. She loved the ride. To go across Vienna was to enter another century, the era of grand palaces and stately ballrooms. As the streetcar passed Symphony Hall, Lisa closed her eyes just as she had many times before and imagined herself sitting perfectly still in front of the grand piano on the stage of the great auditorium. She could hear the opening of Grieg's heroic piano concerto. She straightened her back into the elegant posture her mother had taught her, and when the tension was almost unbearable, she took a breath and began to play. When she finally opened her eyes, the car was passing the Ringestrasse, the majestic tree-lined boulevard where the Grand Court Opera House stood. This was the Vienna of Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Mahler, and Strauss, the great composers of all time. Lisa's mother had filled her head with their stories, and she had made a secret vow to live up to their legacy. In a booming voice, the driver called out her stop, but today, his words were strange and different. Me uh, Meisten singer Strauss. Lisa's heart skipped a beat. Why hadn't the driver said Mahler Strauss? As she climbed down into the great plaza, she saw all the street signs had been changed. The Nazis did not approve of such a grand avenue being named after a Jew. She felt her fury grow, but forced herself to think about the lesson ahead knowing that once she was at the piano, the world outside would disappear. When Lisa reached her destination, she stopped short. A German soldier, tall and emotionless, stood in the doorway of the professor's old stone building. She had been coming to the professor's studio for nearly four years, but this was the first time anyone had been standing guard. He asked coldly, what business do you have here? Well, I have a piano lesson, she replied, trying not to be frightened by the black rifle he held against his gray uniform. The professor will be waiting. The soldier looked up to the second floor window. A figure stared down, then motioned that it was all right for the girl to come up. The soldier grudgingly allowed Lisa to pass. Come in, Miss Jura, Professor Isles said, greeting Lisa with his customary warm handshake. She breathed in the aroma of the white-haired professor's pipe tobacco. For the next hour, she could turn, turn away from all else and be a part of the music she loved. As usual, there was little small talk. Lisa put the score of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on the music stand and sat on the worn piano bench and began to play. The, prof the professor sat forward in his chair and followed her progress with his copy of the score. For most of the hour, Lisa played un in uninterrupted as the old man sat in silence. She hoped to catch him smiling. After all, she had learned the complicated first movement in only a week and had often heard him say that she was his best student. Finally, he put down his music and just listened. She looked over and saw a distressed expression on his face. Was she playing that badly? At the end of the piece, the professor made no comment. He looked at her for a long moment, then finally spoke, looking uncomfortable and ashamed. I am sorry, Miss Jura, but I am required to tell you that I cannot continue to teach you. Lisa was stunned and unable to move. There is a new ordinance, he said slowly. It is now a crime to teach a Jewish child. Lisa felt tears rising. I am not a brave man, he said softly. I am so sorry. Through her tears, she watched the professor pick up a thin gold chain that lay on top of the piano. It held a tiny charm in the shape of a piano. You have a remarkable gift, Lisa. Never forget that 
he said softly, fastening the gold chain around her neck. Perhaps this will help you remember the music we shared here. Lisa stared through her tears at the stoop-shouldered teacher. She was afraid she might never see him again. Gathering her composure, she thanked the professor, collected her things, then turned and fled. The cold November wind sent a deep shiver through Lisa's slender body as she pulled her coat tight around her and stepped onto the streetcar. She looked back and saw Professor Isles wave sadly before disappearing from his window. Why were Germans telling Austrians what they could or couldn't do? It wasn't fair. And why were the Austrians letting them? The ride was endless, its magic gone. She couldn't wait to get back to Franz Birkenstrasse, where everyone in the old neighborhood knew her, the little girl who played the piano. The neighbors knew she had a gift. They could hear her music in the butcher shop. They could hear it in the bakery. The music drifted everywhere. The street itself seemed to smile when the little girl played. People in the neighborhood started calling her by that special word, a prodigy. Music had become Lisa's whole world, an escape from the dark streets, the rundown flats, shops, markets that were home to Vienna's working class Jews. And now the most important escape of all from the Nazis. As she neared 13 Franzenbrückenstrasse, Lisa's steps were uncharacteristically slow. She arrived in her living room and dropped her music on the bench with a gesture that alarmed her mother. What is it, uh, Lisa, what's wrong? Malka took her daughter in her arms and stroked her hair. Lisa cried desperately. Malka guessed what must have happened. Is it, prof is it Professor Isles? Lisa nodded. Don't worry, I taught you before, I will teach you again. Lisa tried to smile at her mother's offer, but they both knew that Lisa had long ago surpassed her mother's ability. Malka went to the cupboard, pulled out the complete preludes by Chop uh, Chopin and sat at the piano. I'll play the right hand, you play the left, Malka insisted. I can't. Play what is in your heart. Lisa sat beside her playing the 4-4 four, four rhythm of the marching, repeating chords. When she mastered the left hand, she took over for her mother, who watched proudly. When they finished, Lisa went to her room and lay down, crying as silently as possible into the pillow. A few minutes later, she felt a warm hand on her shoulder, stroking her gently. It was her older sister, Rosie. Don't cry, Lisa, she urged. Lisa finally rolled over and looked up at the smartly dressed 20-year-old. She was always happy when her older sister made time for her, since Rosie had been spending most of her time these days with her fiancé, Leo. Let me show you something I just learned. Come on, Rosie insisted, taking Lisa by the hand. Lisa stumbled into the bathroom behind her sister and glimpsed at her tear-stained face in the mirror. Rosie emptied out the contents of a cloth bag and spread the powders and paints on the bathroom dresser. I'll show you a new way to do your lips. You'll look just like Marlene Dietrich. As she had so many times before, Rosalie, Rosie carefully applied lipstick and eye makeup to Lisa's face. Without warning, their 12-year-old sister, Sonia, burst through the door. What are you two doing in here? Look at Lisa. Doesn't she look like a movie star? Lisa stared, at, stared excitedly at her new face in the mirror. She looked five years older. The sound of footsteps approaching stopped them in their tracks. Quick, Mama's coming! Lisa scrubbed her face with soap and water, and Rosie scrambled to hide the cosmetics as little Sonia looked on and giggled. Rosie put a protective arm around Lisa, and for a moment, the sorrow of, the sorrow of Professor Isles seemed far away. The three sisters joined hands and emerged to greet their mother. Look out! The Children of Williston Lane, a true story of hope and survival during World War II, Young Readers Edition. Vienna, 1938. Chapter 1.